So this is a, a talk about some work that I've been doing with my Oculus Rift. Um, it is not at all my full-time job. So I, I am a GStreamer developer. I do video streaming technologies um, for my day job. And then a year or two ago, I bought a Rift. And because I'm a, a Linux person, I wanted to use it in Linux. And there is almost no support for the Rift in Linux. So I've been, I got involved with the Open HMD project and have been working with that team and particularly with, uh, with Philip Zabel to introduce, Open HM, uh, introduce Rift support into OpenHMD. Uh, this was supposed to be a pair presentation with me doing parts of it and Philip doing other parts of it, but he, uh, he couldn't make it at the last minute. So I'm um, going to try and say all the things that Philip wanted to say and apologize in advance if I miss out on any of the, the points that he wanted to cover, but we've, we've tried to do it. So the first part is to introduce the OpenHMD project, which many of you are probably already familiar with, but it, it bears a, a little bit of intro. It's a project to try and bring a cross-platform API for generic, very low level access to a variety of HMD devices and their controllers, on top of which people can build richer, higher level frameworks and applications. So it's very much focused on giving driver level support and a unified driver level API for accessing different HMDs. Uh, and to run across a bunch of different platforms. Um, it's doing a pretty good job of, of moving towards that goal. There's a big list of devices that are already supported and there's more coming all the, the time or in this case devices that are now partially supported that we're improving uh, along the way when I can steal time to work on it. So um, I want to talk about the ongoing work to support this headset. So I want to give a bit of an overview of how the Oculus Rift works. Uh, people probably have owned at least one device. There are people in this room that have owned every HMD that's ever existed and then a few others. But, and they, they probably have a good idea of some of this stuff. But, so we're, there is a, a few different parts to the Oculus Rift as it was released, the, the CV1, the first consumer Oculus Rift. We have the headset itself. We have one or two sensor tracker cameras. And we have the um, hand controllers, which are stashed away in the bag here. Um, and they all work together to give you a VR experience where you have both the picture that you're looking at, the ability to interact with it, and the ability to move around in, in what they call room scale VR. So to the work I'm doing most recently, is focusing on the, the, that room scale part of things. Uh, if you have a, a rift like this, what's built into the headset is an IMU that is doing rotation and acceleration tracking. But at least in OpenHMD, when you're just wearing the headset, you're stuck in one place and you can look around. You can't move side to side or walk around a, a scene at all, and the cameras are the part that brings that <laughs> facility. There is also the radio communications part of, of the setup, that the controllers are wireless, they talk to the headset, the USB link back to the laptop is how you get information from the controllers, and the headset's also talking to the cameras the whole time using a Bluetooth LE band, um, using a custom protocol that lives in the Bluetooth LE spectrum. So that, that open 2.4 gigahertz range. And we saw Jacobs talk about how the PlayStation Move controllers work with a standard light camera and big blob balls on the top. The Rift works differently. The plastic on the front of it is a black plastic that's opaque to human eyes but transparent to infrared. And underneath it, dotted in a constellation, is the 
a bunch of infrared LEDs. So when you look at the rift through an infrared camera, you see um, an outline, a, a constellation of infrared blobs that move around as you move the headset. So for tracking the position of the headset, the algorithm is use the camera, watch LEDs, and do magic. And the, the firmware, when you talk to the headset, one of the pieces of information you get back is a list of LED positions. Or when you talk to the controllers, you get back a list of LED locations. So you have a 3D model given to you by the firmware of where the LEDs are on that headset. And that's part of the, the, the information you use in, in the application. This is also to be distinguished from the newer, more recently released Rift S. So we call this outside-in tracking. You have something outside watching the headset and doing the tracking. The newer Rift S has cameras mounted on the headset looking out at the world, and they call that inside-out tracking. And that has some implications, like they changed the style of the controller to put a big loop of LEDs around the outside of your hand so that a downward facing headset has a better chance of spotting them. But we're still trying to get this one working. There are some other people that are starting to tinker with the Rift S elsewhere, and we've seen hints of, of that in the OpenHMD chat channels, but I don't have access to a Rift S and I don't have any more spare time. Uh, we're gonna get the Rift working first before I ever think about how to do inside-out tracking. But there are some similarities. If we can get out, this outside-in working, then some of those pieces feed into how you can do inside-out as well. Uh, another important piece of the, the tracking is that in order to work from a picture of something moving around back to a 3D position of someone moving, you need to do a calibration step so that the software can calculate where the cameras are and use the camera information to place you physically into a, a 3D position in the virtual space. So when you, when you run your Rift, you go through a setup procedure that gives you where, you where you hold the Rift up in front of the cameras or hold a controller up in front of the cameras and it spots that well enough to establish a baseline for the tracking works backwards from that to calculate camera positions and then that becomes an integral part of the overall tracking system. If you change that, you have to rerun the calibration. So which bits of this system work in OpenHMD at the moment? What is there in the latest 0.3.0 release from a few months ago is integration of, so the headset worked in the previous release, what we added, in this one is the controllers. So that means we worked on adding the first pieces of the radio communication so we can get that information streaming from the controllers and the IMU information coming from the controllers. And that goes into three instances of the OpenHMD sensor fusion, which is capable of doing six degree of freedom tracking. So now for all three of the headset and the two controllers, you have uh, pose information. But again, the controllers are stuck somewhere at your side and you can just spin them around and point at stuff and click. You can't move it around yet. No positional tracking. Uh, in my Devel branch, I've also added a mapping for the much simpler little remote control that um, shipped with the Rift before they had hand controllers and it's just you know a little couple of buttons that you can use to click on things. So that's just an extra couple of button outputs. There's no motion tracking for the remote. And uh, we have a basic stream of the radio commands for getting all of that information out, for, for talking to the firmware and getting the LED position, but the LED positions aren't used in the current release of OpenHMD. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, so, uh, Oculus have never re released information about how the CV1 works. It's all, this is all reverse engineered information. So we know how to do any of this stuff because of a, a whole series of um, people 
and especially Philip doing huge amounts of reverse engineering, sniffing USB traces on Windows and looking at enough of them to start to see the patterns and then work backwards to say, well, when it turns on the rift, it's sending these packets, it's getting this back, I'll just start by mimicking that and then I'll change things and see what breaks. And here, the, the body of work that is involved in figuring out a, a system like this is, stuns my mind. I came in much later in the piece when it seems like, you know, I already have effectively a, a software code in Philip's Uvert development tree documenting huge amounts of the, the protocol and I keep asking him, you know, I see it's doing this, but how do you know to do that? It's staring at USB traces. And uh, we have a list of things in the protocol. As they say, we have a list of things we know, the known knowns, then we have a list of things that we know we don't know, and then beyond that, there's probably things that we don't know we don't know. But we have enough to start pulling it together. So we have a working headset, we have working controllers to click, we have the IMU information, and now we want to start pulling in the positional tracking. So the sensors get involved. And a, a sensor uh, is a camera. It looks like a, a standard USB webcam. When you plug it in, it will pop up as a video for Linux device. But then when you try to capture video from it, it tells you here is a YUV image and you'll get mostly garbage because it lies about the configuration of the camera and what it's actually giving you is a grayscale image. So the first thing you have to do to, to display this at all is to override the interpretation of the frames that it gives you and treat them as grayscale frames. Beyond that, it has a whole, it has a set of extra commands, extra USB commands that are not standard UVC things. So I consider it a, mostly a UVC camera with some quirks. Um, it also, it, it has this radio link back to the headset that I mentioned. And the purpose of the radio link is to synchronize a, an exposure trigger. This sends 52 times a second. It sends an exposure trigger over the radio link and every camera simultaneously takes a, a picture of the headset. The purpose of that is that in infrared, it's blinking the LEDs quite brightly during the short exposure time. And the cameras can run with a, a very short exposure and you get a mostly black capture with bright LEDs and it minimizes interference from bright other um, infrared sources to some extent. Um, so if you have a window in the scene that's got bright daylight outside, you'll still have some interference, but it, in general it means you have a much easier time analyzing the frame. Then you have a stream of frames coming back from the cameras. You have also a stream of USB traffic coming on a separate USB device from the HMD and it tells you some inf it tells you which exposures you're doing and you have to match up the packets coming from the HMD with the packets coming from the camera time-wise. There's a bit of jittery that, so that you might get the camera frame slightly before you get the HMD traffic. There's a bit of matching up with which was the closest and that gives you back a number counting from zero to 10 because on the HMD, the LEDs, they, they do this clever thing for the headset where each of the LEDs on it is blinking out a 10-bit code. Every frame they change from bright to slightly less bright and each one has a distinct, unique pattern. So when you know the number coming back from the headset about which bit is currently being presented, you can collect 10 frames of video and start to collect a flicker pattern for each LED and that gives you the identity of each LED to help you match it up to the 3D model. But I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, you also, the, there was also this big uh, stumbling block that we hit working with Linux which for a long time we knew that if you that we could work with one camera, but as soon as you plugged in a second camera and tried to stream from it, Linux would reject your request to enable the second camera and claim that there was not enough USB 3 bandwidth for streaming to 1280 by 960 cameras at 52 hertz. 
And while we're used to trusting Linux in this area, we knew it worked on Windows. So I, and we also knew that there was a, a hack we could do to the Linux kernel where if we uh, told it, if we changed one number that it was calculating inside about the latency of the, the USB traffic, it would enable the camera skip over the bug and it would work. So I got familiar with the USB kernel stack and dug in and um, eventually generated a, a patch that turned out to be my first Linux kernel contribution. I deleted 10 characters from an if statement <laughs> <laughs> and updated the comment attached to it. Uh, it turns out that the bug is uh, related to USB power management and the kernel trying to calculate uh, when it is safe to lower the link to a USB device to save some power. Uh, and because of the particular USB endpoints on this device, it was miscalculating that and deciding that if it turned off the power to that device, it would not be able to bring it up fast enough to let the USB traffic flow. But it was calculating that incorrectly. So now uh, I can connect three cameras I have three sensors. I've been able to test three cameras in parallel, capturing all three simultaneously. And that's working in OpenHMD. As it starts up, it will attempt to it will iterate all your USB devices and it will attempt to open an instance for every, UV, every uh, Rift sensor that it finds and then start streaming video traffic from it. Uh, there's a limitation at the moment, which is that all of that USB capture runs in a single thread and when a frame arrives and it, it, we then analyse it in the callback in that single thread, so quite often we drop frames if the analysis takes too long because when you're streaming 52 frames a second, you have 19.2 milliseconds between frames divided up into smaller chunks, so each USB callback gives you a small chunk of the frame. If you miss even one of them, you've lost a slice of your video frame and we don't. We, th we have to throw that frame away because we can't trust the contents at all. So when the callbacks take too long, with three cameras instead of 19.2 milliseconds, we're down to about six milliseconds between frames for the, any, all this video processing. So one of the to-do items is to split capture into one thread and then hand over frame buffers for analysis into a separate thread. Uh, I should also note that because of all those USB quirks, or uh, I'm not using libuvc for, or the Linux um, UVC driver for any of this. This is a user space um, direct libusb implementation that is talking directly to the USB device and doing all of the low level driver stuff itself to get callbacks with super low latency. But, and also because the libuvc API doesn't give me a way to measure accurately the f timestamp of the first arrival of the start of the frame, so I couldn't get start of frame information accurately enough to, uh, to match it up with the exposure information coming from the HMD. So at the moment, this is all raw USB traffic stuff happening directly in OpenHMD, and um, I'm going to keep it that way. Until we get things working, then we can look at cleaning up. So we have a stream of video images coming in, and we have to look through them and spot the blobs. We have to mark what we think are LEDs in the picture. Then we have to extract an identity information from the blobs. So we have to track the flicker patterns. And as you move the headset around, we want to track the position of blobs moving back and forth. We also have to deal with lens distortion of the camera. So one of the other pieces of information that we get out of the firmware is uh, Philip's guess at, I think this piece of information is some distortion correction values. For the, so he had, he had in his overt code some, here is some distortion correction matrices. Um, when I tried using them with OpenVC, open 
it didn't really match up at the edges very well, so I thought this might not be you know, the correct interpretation. But, so I tried an alternate fisheye lens because it's quite a wide angle lens. I tried a fisheye lens distortion model. And then to test our interpretation, I went right back to fundamentals and you use a chessboard. You take photographs of the chessboard and run it through the distortion calibration. So we got, uh, this is the value that we get out of the firmware itself. I got values to within 1% of those and went, right, that I've measured values that match what we're reading out of the firmware. I think we can call that done. But there are at least four other floating point values in the firmware we don't know what they're for. So there may be more things to do. This is this kind of reverse engineering can happen in um, leaps and bounds or occasional little trickles. And we take this information, we take the, we, we go through the picture, we scan it for bright points, we make a list of potential blobs, we track them from frame to frame by predicting their motion as well as we can and we try and keep them aligned. And what you have at the end is a list of 2D coordinates um, matched to hopefully the correct blinking pattern that you can match to a 3D point in the model. And then you have to do what we call a PNP uh, a position and pose algorithm on those to align as best as possible the, the full 3D model to the to the view that you have because maybe maybe you've um, mismatched a couple of LEDs but you've got a few of them right and the this algorithm can ignore the outliers but hopefully snap you into position fairly well. I also mentioned I'll come back to the blink patterns. The controllers don't have blink patterns. They have just a solid LED in every frame. And further, when we look at what Windows is doing these days, they don't seem to be using blink patterns anymore for their LED acquisition. And the problem of matching up a random set of 2D points that may or may not be LEDs um, and they may or may not be the LEDs for the headset. Now you've got at least three different objects you need to try and match them up to. Becomes a, a much harder and in general unsolved computer science problem that we call correspondence free registration. So that's the, the problem of doing registration of a list of 2D points to match them up to points in a 3D model. And there are a few different approaches to that. This is Philip's bit of the the, the talk. So this is, I, I've been working on the video processing and uh, I've, uh, Philip has been looking into tracking algorithms for doing the pose correspondence tracking. So we have divided up a bunch of papers into two general sets. We have global optimization approaches and we have hypothesize and test approaches. So hypothesize and test, you pick some LED correspondences at random is your hypothesis. You test the plausibility in front of the camera and um, you count how many of your remaining, you project from the, the guess, see how many LEDs match up in the visible picture, count the inliers and if you get enough of them then you hopefully have the correct pose and you keep guessing and keep refining for either some amount of time until you get a good pose. Uh, and then there's soft posit where they will generate a list of potential starting poses and then run an annealing algorithm to filter down to the plausible ones. Or a blind PNP um, where you have some you, pr you generate some pose priors and initialize a Kalman filter and then over several frames try and let the Kalman filter uh, reduce the error bounds to get you an accurate pose. Or there is a, the global opt optimization approach where you give it all of the 2D correspondences and all of the 3D correspondences and it tries to do some cleverer than brute force approach to, to match every possibility by doing branching sub-searches and then bounding the possible solutions. So 
we're working on implementing some of these algorithms from papers and testing the, the different approaches. So uh, if you do this well enough, you end up with a matching pose. You, can, you have a 3D model of the, the headset LEDs and the controller LEDs, and for each one you have a position in 3D space and you have the quaternion that represents its rotation and orientation at that position. And you can back project all of the 3D model back into your 2D view, taking into account lens distortion, match them up, sorry. And um, you say, right, we're locked. We've got tracking lock. So now we can save some effort by fusing the IMU pose and uh, the, the accelerometer gyro information of the headset that we already are processing in OpenHMD. We can also add the ability to interpolate and do blind reckoning of the position over short lengths of time. Um, I don't think I mentioned. The re so the, uh, the IMU, it, can give, it gives you acceleration information. You can uh, do integration of that and you can calculate the motion of the headset. But the problem is that the position drifts very rapidly. The accelerometers are generally not good at giving you that dead reckoning over a second or more. They're good in, short, in the short term, and then they'll very quickly drift. But we're hopefully getting a frame every 19.2 milliseconds. So one second worth of tracking, that's an eternity. Uh, if we can see a frame every half a second, we can still correct and snap the headset position back and we can correct that error in the, the dead reckoning. And further, over the course of a, a, of a single frame, we can have seen the headset get its pose. We're getting updates from the headset at 1,000 hertz, so we're getting a position IMU update every millisecond and from the controllers at 500 hertz every two milliseconds. So now we've got you know, 20 or 10 IMU bits of information about the motion in between when we saw the, the headset. And we can track its pose well enough to now project the next frame and guess where the headset's going to be. And now all we're trying to do is confirm it or get it roughly right, snap it by whatever the tracking error was, and then feed that back in to the, the sensor fusion to track position properly. So in OpenHMD, the IMU sensor fusion that's there at the moment does that six degree of freedom tracking. It doesn't track position with the IMU at all, and it keeps a very short history buffer of about 20 samples which gives us about 20 milliseconds worth of history. And we want the ability to capture from the camera, which starts at, a, you know, we know when the frame starts arriving on the USB, we can timestamp when that exposure happened. But by the time we've finished processing all of the video data, especially across three cameras, it may be six or seven milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, you know, later. We now want to go back and fix what the position, we want to do correction on what the sensor fusion was in the past and then replay the history but forwards to get where we think we are with minimal error. So we want to probably do a sensor fusion, a change in the, the sensor fusion both to track position and do that dead reckoning and to be able to uh, reintegrate correction information that is provided much later and replay forwards in time. So we now, when the position we're reporting is as accurate as possible. Um, oh, so that's the first few points of this slide. Uh, so there's a change. We want to change the way OpenHMD is doing its sensor fusion, uh, at least for the Rift to start with and then potentially for other headsets later. Other headsets that are six degree of freedom probably don't need anything more sophisticated than what's already there to extract gravity vectors. Um, but for 
full nine degree of freedom tracking we do. So we're, we're looking into Kalman filtering, which is a big uh, learning curve for both Philip and I, because the last time I spoke the words Kalman filtering was 20 years ago in university, and then six months ago when I started working on OpenHMD. So I've been relearning a lot of things and then extending my knowledge of, of that. I have also found from uh, some blogs from when Oculus were developing the, the DK2 that they talked more openly about what some of the things they were doing internally and that before they clammed up and became Facebook. And in, back then they talked about things like Savitsky, Golay filters that uh, do polynomial fitting to give you these uh, prediction, this prediction information that we need when we want to predict between frames. So there's, a, there's some, lots, of, lots of investigation and experimentation to do on that front. Uh, so beyond what's been released in the most recent open HMD distribution, the work in our development branches goes take open HMD 0.3, take a bunch of code from Philips Uvert library um, that includes the UVC traffic, the radio synchronization code, the LED blinking patterns, some code to watch blobs in the, the, and identify blobs. It does filtering based on whether they are roughly circular, based on relative width and height. It does tracking of blobs to try and predict a a motion vector, and this is all done as 2D. This is without integrating any of the IMU dead reckoning, so this is all just 2D video processing per frame on each camera. And it has code to read out the LED models. And then do, once you've got all those pieces, we're using an OpenCV PNP ransack function to match the LED 2D positions and the 3D positions to extract a pose. I added beyond that the multiple camera instances, um, tuned the UVC code a little bit to um, not be quite so hard coded to what to the values that window, Windows uses, but to allocate a few extra buffers and hopefully give us a bit more resilience against packet loss and delays. Uh, I've done some tweaks to Philips Flickr pattern tracking to make it more stable because one of the things that I've noticed is that it's the flicker patterns are extremely unreliable as you move the headset around. You get natural variations in the brightness of an LED that are very hard to distinguish from exposure variations deliberately done by the headset. So that's another good reason for us to move away from the flicker patterns and to be able to do uh, registration, direct registration. And I've got the start of a a Kalman filter that operates on the tracked position per camera but isn't done in the sensor fusion. So that is the next big body of work. And I have what I hope is an interesting bit of development model for other VR developers in the room where I got pretty sick of the testing method where I would change something in the code and then pick up the headset and waggle it around and not really be able to tell if anything was better or not. What I want is a more scientific method of having a complete trace recorded to disk that I can replay through an algorithm and test changes and actually get metrics out. So what I'm using is a, a thing called Pipewire has anyone heard of Pipewire? Who knows what pipe? Who doesn't know what Pipewire is? Anyone? Okay. So, who knows what Pulse Audio is? Who knows what Jack is? No. Okay. So, there, these are various demons in the the Linux world for accessing sound devices um, and sharing sound devices. You have a uh, an audio device on a laptop, it generally is a s one thing can write to it at a time. So you need a higher level layer that can share that hardware. And Pipewire grew out of an inspiration to do that for video as well. So it's a server that from which you can connect to sources of video. 
So you can connect to the webcam instead of doing it directly to your VLC uh, video for Linux device. You go through Pipewire and Pipewire can now provide the webcam to multiple applications at once or um, do access control on it. So you no longer need each application popping up and asking you, hey, this thing wants access to your webcam. You can now have it at the desktop level that you control the, that privacy access. But uh, it also processes audio. And one of the goals of Pipewire is to replace all these other audio server things like Jack and Pipewire with one stack that can do video and real-time high um, you know, presentation level, low latency audio. And it's making good progress towards that goal. And I am using it because you can also generally become a publisher of a video stream in Pipewire pretty trivially. There's a, a couple of hundred lines of code that turns open HMD when it's compiled in debug mode for me into a Pipewire source available to the rest of the system. And my, so here's my, here's my plan. If you have any application using OpenHMD at its lower le level to do VR, and you're on Linux, so every other platform for now can go away. Um, Pipewire lets me feed the sensor information, the video stream coming out of the camera directly to an external debugging or recording application. And alongside that, ideally what I would do is attach also the metadata of the IMU information and the exposure phase and the LED blobs as metadata on each video frame. But um, the Pipewire version that I have in Fedora 30 on my development box doesn't have that feature. It's been implemented in Git, that kind of thing. So I am doing a, a hack that works with released versions of the software instead where I send along parallel streams. I have a video stream and then I have parallel streams that contain all the metadata. And at least that's the plan. I've got as far as announcing those debug streams and not putting anything in them yet. Um, we're talking the third of this month that I was doing this last and then I've been a bit busy for the last couple of weeks. So you're getting the current status uh, very much as of the last time I was able to touch it. Then I have a, taken the tracker algorithm that, we're, that I'm running inside OpenHMD and I use the same source files to compile out a GStreamer plugin. And GStreamer then that integrates as a filter inside any GStreamer pipeline to receive the video stream and run a simulation of the video tracking exactly as it's being done in OpenHMD as a proxy for really sending metadata streams. And because I don't have metadata, I also have a little hack where I change the top pixels of the video to give me the exposure phase and then read it back out of the pixel data. Then I, have, then I can take that and I can use GStreamer to record a trace. Later I'll add the metadata and I'll either just have a text stream of JSON alongside it or something more sophisticated like a KLV metadata stream. But that's cool. Now I have an exact recording of some session. I can record all two or three sensors in parallel and I can be storing the JSON stream of the IMU from the headsets and the controllers and have the full session ready to replay and test any algorithm change. Um, I can walk through that session and I can hand label what the ground truth should be and then really have a comparison of how well is this matching what really happened. And also uh, at the moment what I'm doing is I'm capturing all the video in, as, in one thread as if I had no debugging, then doing a full mem copy of every frame out into the pipe wire buffers so they can be sent to the debug process, but I could save a whole bunch of memory copies by directly capturing into pipe wire buffers and do zero copy transfer across to the debug application because pipe wire can do efficient zero copy DMA buff or um, FD 
descriptor transfers of the video frame from one process to another. Similar to the, some of the techniques Labosch is using for XR desktop in that respect. So I think I've talked a bit about what's missing. Um, we don't have the IMU interpolation between frames to really keep the tracking lock. Uh, so it's all very much based on whether you see the right blobs in a, a frame at any given point. We don't have the, any kind of config store in OpenHMD where we can store the room calibration or the, the LED models. Uh, it's quite expensive, like you know, 50 or 100 milliseconds at startup time for each controller to read the stream of firmware back over that slow radio link. So it's better to read it and cache that and then just check a checksum. So there's a config store would be useful for that. We don't have the blink-free, flicker-free, solid LED tracking and correspondence registration. That's probably the next most important thing to do. And Beyond that, we're just doing video processing. None of this feeds into actually setting the position of the controllers or the headset yet. So OpenHMD still reports everything the same as it does in the release of, of you just standing still because the tracking is so unreliable, it jumps all over the place right now. You'd just be teleported randomly and nauseously. We're also missing some things from OpenHMD in general that would be useful for making it a replacement, a complete replacement for the Windows version, the commercial drivers on Windows that you use when you really buy a Rift for playing games. So that has things like firmware updates, downloads, or the initial device sync where you have to pair the controllers with the headset. So that, that kind of pairing initial setup API is missing from OpenHMD. Um, if I have some interest in a minute or two, I have a, a couple of demonstrations that I could do. Um, otherwise, I can just quickly play a, a little video for people. But, um, so let's bring this over here. So in the one window, I go in and I run the OpenHMD simple example, which then connects to the, to the thing and it starts streaming. And if I roll that around, you'll see that the numbers for, for the rotation quaternion are changing using the existing algorithm. And then in the GST subdirectory, I have Sorry, I just had to reboot my laptop, so I've probably lost. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, so there's the. Okay, so there's the the little video running live from the headset. And you see the little grey squares up in the top left corner that are the tracking exposure information being placed in there. And then I, if I stop that filter and then add an OHMD Rift filter, uh, that's not what it's called, what do I call it? It's a Rift sensor. Now we are additionally doing the blob tracking inside GStreamer based on the video. And green LEDs represent ones where it thinks that it's detected a correspondence and then when it locks, it draws little um, crosses where, the, where it thinks the headset is. So you can see it jump around as it does a bad job of tracking that flicker. But when it locks in, it's kind of nice. You get it doing that and if I move it slowly enough it'll retain the tra tracking but if I jump it around it will all the LEDs will turn purple to say it doesn't know what they are and then go green again when you hold them still watch the tracking jump around 
So that's that's the live debug. Or if I want to, then I can change. So the pipe wire source give, captures the video from the remote process, and then I can do stuff like feed that through a JPEG, and then turn it into an MP4 file and write it out to a And now I'm recording the stream. I hit control C and I can hopefully play it back exactly as it was just captured with the raw data stashed away. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Or? Yeah, we can do one yeah. or two questions. Yeah. OK. Oh, re really cool talk and even better demo. So uh, when I was toying around with GStreamer and VR, I always had the dream of uh, actually transmitting the, uh, transmitting the tracking data through the pipeline. Um, and now with pipe wire on the horizon and with its generic feature set, uh, I, want, I was wondering um, how can we get uh, structures for, because you we were transmitting JSON, how can we define structures for raw IMU data or other tracking related structures like maybe filtered quaternion uh, and uh, position vector? Uh, how can we get that in Pipewire? Is there interest upstream for having uh, native VR structures, uh, or what was your experience with that? So I talked to Wim about the best way to implement my metadata stream, and he said, I'm, I have a new thing called a control stream that is about a, a guaranteed delivery lossless stream that he is using for MIDI data, and he said it's a generic transport for just transporting blobs of data in Pipewire. There's no, so the Pipewire source in GStreamer is specific to um, doing media transfer. If I, so it only, it only announces and can connect to Pipewire sources that are outputting things it knows about. So it says it's source template any, but I think internally it just does video and audio. But we can teach it a new type of stream, so we can, we can teach Pipewire about the control stream we want and then have this output a stream of it, whatever we want. And I think I, I was picking JSON because I want to do develop work where I can change it on the fly without having to rewrite my Pipewire integration. So having it just transfer a opaque blob of stuff that I label text raw and store it as if it were a subtitle stream. All I want is timestamps and something that I can get out and interpret the data myself. That'll work for me. Uh, building a definition of a structured stream makes it more rigid, and, you can see, and then you need a um, protocol specification for what you're going to pass around. I'm going to stick with JSON just for this for the for the moment. Um, KLV is another option that's used pretty widely for generic metadata transfer in the broader world, and GStreamer has, in the last couple of years, gained some support for KLV metadata streams. Last question. Uh, hi. Uh, is it works for controllers too? The, so because the controllers don't blink, and we have no mechanism for doing the matching between 2D observed spots in the picture, and we have no ability to match those to a 3D model generally. It's relying on the blink patterns right now, and only the headset does the blink patterns. But when we can work with flicker-free tracking, it'll work for the controllers the same as it works for the headset. They just become a separate tracked object. And in fact, at that point, we are not constrained to what Oculus cells, we can go further and reverse engineer some more and reverse engineer the radio protocol and build our own tracked objects. Thanks.
Thank you all very much. Hope you enjoyed it.